Mitt Romney was recorded foolishly saying, Corporations are people, my friend. Corporations are people, my friend. And it went viral. The corporate media didn't cover that. Ordinary people did. That night, that fellow put his smartphone recording on YouTube and sent it out and it went viral, meaning that people forwarded it. This is the key, my friend. We've got to start learning to use this media. I just want to say right now, the only reason you're even watching this right now is because the person behind the camera who is Jeff and Grace, Grace and Jeff are the people's media. It's not corporate media. They're ordinary people who are actually using this medium for us to talk to each other because Grace and Jeff actually don't hate the media. They've become the media. We've got to learn to become the media ourselves and do what Jeff and Grace are doing. We've got to actually start to do this. So, quick question. How many people here have a Facebook account? Be honest. Now, put your hands down because here's my follow-up question. How many people here are willing to use your status update to say, I just joined www.movetoamend.org? You should too. If you're willing to do that, raise your hand. If everybody does that, we will talk to several hundred more people just like that. The genius of social media is we're learning to talk to each other apart from the corporate filter. Thanks, folks. I want to thank you all for being here. My name is David Cobb. I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I'm a pissed off American citizen. I'm glad to see a little head nodding here and I'm glad that we've got a little agreement here because I will also personally self-identify as a political progressive. And frankly, as a political progressive, I think that we have made a mistake by allowing the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on political anger. Because if you talk to a Tea Party supporter, if you talk to a Tea Party adherent, just have a conversation with them, person to person. Just engage them. And I've done this, and you will find almost universally what they're angry about is the fact that Wall Street America and the big banks destroyed the economy of the United States. But what really gets their goat is that the American federal government then rewarded them with about a trillion dollars of our tax money. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too, aren't you? Right? Progressives are angry about that, and we make a mistake if we allow the Tea Party to be the only place where that political anger is expressed. Because I'll go one deeper and tell you I'm also angry about the fact that one in six American families are living below the poverty level. And I don't hear that particular anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. I'm angry about the fact that between one in four and one in five American children go to bed hungry or undernourished in the richest country the world has ever seen, and I don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'm angry about the fact that the large transnational corporations are basically destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself, causing a runaway global climate crisis, and creating a racist, sexist, and class oppressive world order with the plunder. And I certainly don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And the anger that I'm describing right now, and the anger that I can tell so many of you share with me, that anger, may I say, is a righteous anger. And I use that word very carefully. It is a righteous anger. I'm the grandson of a Baptist preacher. And I use the word righteous with conviction, with clarity, and sincerity. That is a righteous anger because, you see, righteous anger is a unique type of anger requires two things. First, you have to ask, what are you angry about? See, if you get angry because you just didn't get your way, that is not righteous, by definition. You see, righteous anger must be provoked by oppression, injustice, unfairness. But I'll have to go even deeper and tell you that just because you get mad at injustice, unfairness, oppression, if all you do is then just sit and stew in it and wallow in it, that's not righteous either. You see, righteous anger requires action. Those are the two components. Are you angry about injustice and oppression? And then, does it propel you to act? That's what righteous anger means. And according to that definition, I'll tell you, it was righteous anger that fueled the abolitionist movement in this country. People were angry about a depraved institution like slavery. It was righteous anger that brought those women together at Seneca Falls to start the women's empowerment movement. They were angry at a patriarchal society and system, political and economic, that treated them like second-class citizens. It was righteous anger that fueled the trade union movement in this country. Righteous anger was behind the civil rights movement. Righteous anger is a good thing. And 
Another interesting thing about righteous anger, when you allow yourself to become angry at injustice and then it propels you to act for justice, for fairness, to correct the, the wrongs, you'll discover joy. It's an amazing thing how that works. When you actually will allow yourself to get involved in creating something more fair and more, more just, not only will it become joyful for you, but it will put you in contact with other people who are doing the same thing and will discover the best parts of our humanity. And it will actually remind us about what it feels like to be an actual community with other people outside of our isolation that is so often what the corporate media tries to instill upon us and cr to create amongst us. So righteous anger is a good thing. And I'll tell you this. I'm also a sad American because I can remember a time in my life that I was a proud and patriotic American with no other qualifier. And for me personally, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. But more importantly, I was taught that the United States of America stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so very proud of that. Not only that, I was taught that my country, the United States, was like some great shining light on the hill and that we were going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality to the entire world. I was so proud to be from that country and then I became angry because I grew up and realized I had been lied to. But you know what? I got it. That's a harsh word. So instead, let's say, I grew up and realized I had been subjected to a creation myth. Because a lie is a harsh way to say it because I actually have a, a, a name, a face, a voice that I can associate that creation myth with. And for me personally, that voice, that name is Mrs. Armstrong. She was my fifth grade teacher. Are there any current, future, or former public teachers in this crowd? There always are. Can we get a round of applause for our public teachers? I'm serious about this. I always ask. I always ask for a round of applause for public teachers in this presentation for two reasons. One, I don't think we give public teachers enough acknowledgement in this country. We certainly didn't pay you enough money. But the second reason I ask for that round of applause is in honor of Mrs. Armstrong. You see, Mrs. Armstrong didn't go to bed at night saying, Wah, ah, 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 ah. I can't wait till these little children come into my classroom so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda about this country. No. Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher. And like every public school teacher I've ever met, she became a teacher because she wanted to nurture children. She wanted to help create children to become productive members of their society. She actually felt like teaching was a noble profession. You see, Mrs. Armstrong taught that creation myth because she believed it. And deeper, that creation myth worked on me, it worked on my classmates, and as I'm watching how most of you are reacting to me, it worked on most of you, because we want to believe it. You see, we want to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And in fact, I'll tell you this, we deserve it. It is our birthright. And I really want to be clear about this. American children absolutely want and deserve liberty, justice, and equality. No doubt about it. And you know what? So do Iraqi children, and Afghan children, and Mexican children, and Senegalese children, and Israeli children, and Palestinian children. The point I'm making is those things that we were taught about American values, if we really dig deep, we'll realize those are human values. And that is a beautiful sentiment, isn't it? To imagine that we might actually be part of helping to create an entire world where every child gets to experience their birthright, their ability to actually come to the fullest expression of their abilities. Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? And frankly, folks, I believe that is possible, genuinely and sincerely. This generation of humans might be the first time where we have the technology, available to us, we have a worldwide movement that is actually in the beginning stages. Think of it as a democracy movement. And frankly, take a look at what's happening in the Middle East or North Africa or Latin America and we see a genuine democracy movement bubbling up. And I'll tell you this, folks, frankly, as North Americans, we ought to have a little more humility and recognize that we're actually sort of late to the game in terms of actually 
thinking about how a functioning democracy might actually operate. And I'll tell you this, it's clear to me that in order to usher in that world, to help to be the, the midwives, if you will, of helping to create that world, it's going to require us to be very persuasive when we talk to other people. You see, I'll tell you this, I don't think that we have to persuade them that this is what they want. Polling data shows the American people already want a different world. What we have to do is be persuasive that it's possible, which is a different kind of persuasion. But it's still persuasion. And because I want to try to be persuasive, I think it's important to recognize and, and acknowledge something that I knew intuitively as a trial lawyer, and now scientists are proving objectively and without a doubt. And that is, if you want to be persuasive, facts don't matter so much. <laughs> Listen, man. Of course, I'm talking about the work of George Lakoff and, and other cognitive scientists. Uh, and when I first heard that, I thought, oh, no. See, I've invested a lot of time and energy in learning facts and thought, well, if you just you know, learn the facts, learn how to present them cogently, lucidly, logically, that people will draw the conclusions and, and people will just act accordingly. But look, it's not fair to say facts don't matter at all. That, I, that was a bit of an artifice. But it is true to say this, if you want to be persuasive, you have to understand that human beings do not come to conclusions, nor do we even understand how the world operates through discrete facts. We understand how the world operates through the stories we tell each other. That's the important work of Lakoff and his idea around framing and cognitive science. They're telling us that we understand the world through stories. And more stories that are told over and over again become the cultural frame or the cultural stories of how we understand the world. And then what happens is once you understand what the story is, then you can appreciate that people then process new facts in light of the story that we already have in our head about how the world operates, how reality operates. So if we want to be persuasive, stories are what matter. That's how we understand the world. And so I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are not just exercising power today. I'm going to tell a story about how it came to be that large transnational corporations are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, I will submit to you that unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are basically ruling us because they are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect all of our lives. Corporate CEOs already decided what your transportation choices will be. Corporate CEOs have already decided the energy policy of this country. Corporate CEOs are encroaching ever more on the educational process in this country. Corporate CEOs are deciding how much poison will be in the water that we're drinking and the air that we're breathing. Corporate CEOs are deciding how much health care we'll get, or for many of us, how much we won't get. Hell, corporate CEOs decided whether to take this country to war. And we, the people, are left to choose between paper or plastic at the grocery store. We get to choose between Coke and Pepsi. There are 31 flavors of ice cream at Baskin and Robin, 17 different types of toothpaste at any reasonably well-stocked department store that you go to. And I applaud and thank the fact that I live in a country where I have so many consumer choices. I'm not down on consumer choices, but don't make the mistake that consumer choices is the same thing as political power. There is a difference there, right? So. How this story unfolds, I think, is very important. And in order to tell this story, I'm going to make sure that we cover four concepts together. The first concept that I'm going to cover is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in this country. So to make sure we've got some common agreement and common ground, let me ask this question. What language is the word democracy from? Greek. It's from Greek. Let's break it down. Demos means? Anybody know? The people. Kratia means? Power. power, or rule. So literally, the word democracy means the people rule. Quick pop quiz. How many folks believe we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. <laughs> Look around. Not a single hand in the air. 
Folks, I do this presentation all across the country. Today, I did one in Georgetown, and I'm doing one tonight. I did this presentation 150 times last year. I ask this question everywhere I go, and almost nobody raises their hand to that question. That, my friends, is a problem. But from another perspective, I would tell you it's a good thing. What? No, it's not a good thing that we the people don't rule, but I think it's a good thing that we're finally being adult enough to confront reality, that we're actually willing to acknowledge that we don't live in the society that we thought we did, that we don't actually have the functioning democratic republic that Mrs. Armstrong taught me and that other folks taught us. This, as hard as that is, I tell you it's a good thing because... Just like a doctor, if you go to a doctor, she or he doesn't ask for like what's ailing you just so she can say, oh, that's just terrible, tell me more. No, a doctor wants to understand what's going on so that we can get a proper diagnosis because that proper diagnosis will then suggest the treatment regimen. Point I'm making is, as hard as it is to come to terms with the fact that we don't live in a functioning democratic republic, it's a good thing to acknowledge that because it suggests to us what we ought to be doing. Because although we don't yet live in a truly functioning democratic republic, we can. And I think that there's a roadmap to get there. The second topic that I'll talk to is very closely related. That's the word sovereignty. By the way, folks, if I just had the word the sovereign, who or what would you think of? The sovereign. King, king. Almost everybody thinks of king when I say sovereignty or the sovereign, that's because the word sovereignty means the authority to rule. And the reason that so many of us and so many of you immediately popped the word the king popped into your mind when I just said the sovereign is because of the stories that we've been told in this culture, in this society. Because 500 years ago, the king was the sovereign. The sovereign was the king. Those words were synonymous, in fact. The king had ultimate authority to rule. And where, by the way, did the king get authority to rule? God. You don't get more legitimate. I mean, that's kind of a big deal, right? And in order to really illustrate what I mean by that, we're going to do a quick little exercise together. This exercise is always a lot of fun for me. You'll see. I will invite uh, this assembled group of human beings to close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> I told y'all this was fun for me. Uh, let me try another one. Uh, and as the king, David is God's representative on earth. I'll try one last one. And therefore, anything that David says must be obeyed without question. <laughs> okay, you know what? At this point, I would normally say, okay, folks, open your eyes. But to your credit, Austin, Texas, nobody's eyes are closed. Good on you. But I will make this second observation, and that is, you did what every other crowd does. As soon as you realized what I was asking you to say, your eyes popped open and you all laughed at me. I mean, did you notice there was this the collective guffaw? Everybody kind of laughed and chuckled about it. You know why you laughed about it? Well, because it's funny. I mean... Like, and not funny as in, oh, David has just made a very witty and droll comment. <laughs> no, it wasn't that sophisticated. I mean, any comedian would tell you that this is absurd humor. I said something so absurd, so ridiculous, that the only appropriate response for you to was to laugh at it. I mean, for me to say to this fella how to live your life because who my parents are, that is absurd. Of course you laugh at it. Or even better, that I get to say how all of society is going to be organized and functioning because of the divine right of kings. Of course you laugh at that. That's hilarious. It's beyond absurd. And 500 years ago, human beings just like you and you and me and you not only said it, but we believed it. I want you to take a moment and recognize that sovereignty or who gets to make the decisions about how we organize ourselves is maybe one of the fundamental decisions that a people make for themselves. As a sociologist, Mike, I think you'll appreciate that, right? That's one of the first principal kinds of questions that any society makes, right? 
Who gets the authority to rule? What are the mechanisms to make it? What is the authority to make those rules? Let me tell you something, folks. I am a Green Party member. Many of you know that. I'm proud of that. I'm equally proud to say I work very closely with progressive Democrats. In fact, I brought the progressive Democrats and the coffee party into the Move to Amend Coalition. I'm very proud of that. I'm equally proud to tell you that I have a long history of working with Republicans and Libertarians, especially on civil liberties issues. Frequently, those are my best allies. So I've got a history of working with them. I also have a history of working with anarchists and socialists. If I can find common ground with somebody to work on something, I will do so. I tell you that not so you'll pat me on the head. I say that so you'll appreciate what I mean when I say, in my 25 years of social change efforts, I haven't had the privilege or the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. <laughs> and 500 years ago, that's all there were. And 500 years is the blink of an eye in human history. And so when people tell me, oh, we can't amend the Constitution, it's too hard. We can't do that. I think, have you not been paying attention? The kind of profound change that has been made in human society, not only in world history, but in U.S. history, is very significant. Because let me tell you something, folks. If enough people think that something is true, and enough people act like it's true, it's true. And so, if it is true that this is a racist, sexist, and class-oppressive society, and it is, then maybe we ought to start thinking differently and start to act differently. Maybe we ought to actually act like we really believe that we're in a crisis moment. Because we are in a crisis moment. And it's going to require us to start to think bigger and bolder. And, may I say, it's going to require us to actually have the courage to imagine living in the world that we actually want to live in. Because frankly, the biggest censor in the United States today is not the federal government. The biggest censor is not even corporate media. We are the biggest censors. We censor ourselves constantly about what is possible, about what is able to be done. And we end up asking for less and less and less and less because we're not actually willing to believe that we have the capacity to actually make changes. And let me tell you something, folks. I believe we, the people, are more powerful than we dare to imagine. We've got so much power, but we're not exercising it. That will take me, actually, to my next concept, which is the, co the phrase legal personhood. Please note that I did not write corporate personhood on the board, but instead legal personhood. That's because I want us to understand that legal personhood, in a nutshell, means the ability to assert rights. And when we're talking about legal personhood, we mean the ability to assert rights under law. And when we say it that way, isn't it obvious that the question of who is a legal person with rights under law has been one of the fundamental political struggles in this country. From the very inception of this country, this has been one of like the thing that was fought over the hardest and the most. Legal personhood matters, and it matters a great deal. And this will bring us to the last concept, and that's the word corporation. Because I think that the word corporation is equally important. I will ask the same question about this word that I did about democracy. What language is the word corporation from? It's from Latin. Let's break it down. Corpus means body. And now for extra credit point, any Latin scholars, can you tell me what the suffix T-I-O-N means in Latin? It means the state of, or the quality of. So literally the word corporation, just translating it, would mean to have or create body. And in this case, I mean literally physical body. And that's because we are taught in law school. By the way, are there any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would admit it? I got one hand, and then I got the sister who's doing like this. Fair enough, but you, so you went to law school. Yes. Went to law school. So do y'all remember, my brother and sister at the bar, do y'all remember being taught that a corporation is a legal fiction? Yep, of course. Both of them saying, yes, absolutely. Every lawyer that I talk to will remember that. In fact, that is so commonly understood that even if you weren't subjected to the law school experience, if you've heard that a corporation is a legal fiction, even if you couldn't exactly, precisely define what it means, if you've just heard that a corporation is a legal fiction, raise your hand. 
Look at all those hands go up. So a corporation is legal fiction. It's a legal fiction. It's a legal fiction. That begs the question, what does the word fiction mean? Made up. Made up, not real. Literally, we are taught in law school that a corporation doesn't exist in the physical world. However, we will pretend like this group of people and the material and the resources and the contractual obligations and the, and the concepts will pretend like this is one thing so we can treat it a certain way under law. And remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. poof, we can create a corporation. The point I'm making, a corporation is a construct. It is literally a construct. It doesn't exist in the physical world but we can pretend like it does in order to do certain things. And the word corporation is from Latin because the first corporations ever created by the genius of human creativity were created during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking ourselves, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. Just saying. Or as the great Texas comedian Bill Hicks would say, just planting seeds. Just, just planting seeds for later. <laughs> but the point is, the corporation was created by the Romans for a reason. And that reason was to do things. For example, y'all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Here it is, 2,000 years later, we still say that. All roads lead to Rome. Check it out. That road system was imagined, built, and maintained as a Roman corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula, was conceived of, built, maintained as a Roman corporation. And I think that's especially important to recognize that this aqueduct system did it without electricity. And as a quick parenthetical, that's one of the things that gives me so much optimism, is to recognize humans are clever, really smart. In fact, you can't name a problem that if I have access to an internet and 30 minutes, I can't find somebody a hell of a lot smarter than me that already has a solution for that problem. There are solutions to every single problem that vexes us in this country and in fact on the world. The problem is that we don't actually have the political power to implement the solutions that already exist. Likewise, by the way, in terms of corporations, the first universities in Rome, the first hospitals in Rome, can you guess? Corporation, corporation. So here's a quick pop quiz. What does a road system, a water system, an aqueduct, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? They're all public. Everything I just mentioned is a public utility or a public good or a public asset. The idea of the corporation is actually genius. David Cobb is not anti-corporation. The move to amend coalition is not anti-corporation. Corporations have and can still be put to incredibly important things. It's actually a genius way to think about how to organize society. You see, at its nutshell, what the corporation does is to take private money, material, and resources and put it to public use. But there's another way that the government takes private money. What's that called? Taxes. Listen, I'm not here to denigrate taxes. In fact, have y'all heard that Texas is in a budget crisis? Have y'all heard that rumor? Have y'all heard that the United States is in a budget crisis? It's a lie. We're not in a budget crisis. We're in an allocation crisis. That's different. But we're not in a budget crisis. In fact, if we wanted to solve the misnamed budget crisis, there's a simple three-word solution that uses the word tax. If you know it, you can say it with me. Tax the rich. Problem solved. So I don't think taxes are a bad thing, but I do think that it's important to recognize when the tax person shows up, she or he doesn't say, hey, it's tax time. Would you be willing to pay a little bit? Uh, Ma'am, has that been your experience uh, dealing with tax authorities? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> See, this is the thing. And the Romans, likewise, when the Roman, gladi uh, the Roman centurion showed up, they showed up with the spear and said, tax time, pay up. See, taxes are mandatory. They're required. The genius of the idea of the corporation was to take private money, material, and resources, organize it on a voluntary basis, and put it to some public use. For example, if I were to say, hey, I've got this really great idea, would you please make a donation to me and this group of people who are doing this thing so that we can do some public good? 
in modern terms, we would think of that as a nonprofit corporation. Or if I say, I've got a great idea, it's going to be very successful, a lot of people are going to want to do this, uh, but if you will invest some money, I will return your investment, that would be a for-profit corporation. But the point is, under both of those scenarios, I'm not compelling either one of you. I'm not requiring either one of you. I'm trying to convince and persuade you. At the end of the day, I want to underscore again, the idea of the corporation is a good idea. So, move to amend is not anti-corporation. But let's also acknowledge that. This is not exactly how the modern transnational corporation operates, is it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually doesn't come out of this framework. The modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 14th, 15th, and 16th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. I have to put the word discovery in quotation marks, right? Because what did the Europeans discover in the 14th and 15th century? Well, <laughs> specifically Africa, Asia, later North and South America. As the gentleman points out, what's your name, sir? Ken. Ken. As Ken points out, here's a news flash. There were people living there. They weren't lost. <laughs> they didn't need to be discovered. And so, in the same interest and the same conviction of being courageous and honest, let's just be honest. The 14th and 15th century of Europe isn't the age of discovery at all. It's the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder and exploitation. For me, there's one word that sums it up. That's imperialism. And that's what empire means. It means beating people down and stealing their resources and making it your own. And get this, the modern transnational corporation wasn't just accidentally created during this time period. The modern transnational corporation, or the joint stock company, was intentionally and deliberately created as an instrument of empire. In fact, one of the most famous of those early joint stock companies was known as the East India Company, literally designed to facilitate the military conquest and conquering of the entire subcontinent of India, right? And not only that, not only to destroy those people's military defenses, but also to destroy their existing institutions that had heretofore been meeting their needs and replace them with new institutions. To literally force those people to reorganize their society so they were helping to facilitate the theft of their own resources so that they could be sent to the shareholders of the joint stock company of the East India Company. And to begin to tell new stories, to begin to colonize the minds of the Indians. See, this is the thing. Colonism, when it's done really effectively, isn't just about the physical world. It's about our imagination space. And I got to say, one of the problems in America today, we are colonized. And I don't mean just those people who are watching television or the Super Bowl or what have you. I mean all of us. I mean me. I mean we are subjected to a kind of col colonial process every day. Another of the early joint stock companies, by the way, was a little outfit known as the Africa Trading Company. Would anybody like to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? You know, thank you. I heard a couple of different words there, and I'm going to use myself as an example because I think it's important that we be courageous, and I think it's especially important that white people be willing to talk like this because I'm going to acknowledge that if I'm just being, ca even though I ask the question, and I ask this question every day, right? But if I'm, uh, if I'm being casual, if I'm sort of not really thinking very, very, very hard and sharp, I'll promise you, honestly, the word that usually pops into my mind, the Africa Trading Company traded slaves. That's the word that just pops into my mind. I don't think it makes me a bad person, right? I'm not, it, it, but it makes me a colonized person because I've been taught about the African slave trade and Harriet Tubman is the hero of the runaway slaves. And, you know, I've, I've heard all those kind of stories. But since I've made a big deal about that particular word, here's my follow-up question. At this time period that the Africa Trading Company existed, was Africa populated by slaves? No, Africa was populated by? People, human beings, right? And may I say, Africa was populated by people who were basically just like me. And I say that with full awareness of my pigment. I'm not stupid. I know I'm white. 
But I say Africa was populated by people out of conviction because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, she or he will tell you race does not exist. Sure, skin pigment exists, ethnicity exists, but no scientist, no biologist would elevate those to a taxonomy or a classification. So without a doubt, under science, race does not exist. But check this out. Racism damn sure does. How can that possibly be? Well, remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, poof, race is a construct just as surely as the corporation is a construct. It gets created. We don't normally think about these things, but if we start asking the first principles kinds of questions, they become very illuminative. They, they help us understand the world. And I'm not going to tell you that the corporations created slavery because slavery pre-existed this time period. But that slavery was a little bit different. In fact, I'll use this gentleman as an example. Sir, what's your first name? Paul. Paul. I'll use Paul as an example. Let's say that Paul and David live in different tribes. And there's a river that separates Paul's tribe from David's tribe. And my tribe goes to war against Paul's tribe. And David's tribe wins the war against Paul's tribe. And uh, by the way, why do y'all think David's tribe might win this war? Why do y'all think my tribe might win? What are some reasons? <laughs> ah, nicely done. Nicely done. You see how important the stories are? Unfortunately for you, Paul, I am telling the story. So my tribe wins the war. I put my spear against Paul's throat and I say, Paul, you're my slave. Let me ask y'all, what's the intellectual justification for David to enslave Paul? Might, the sword, nothing more. The point I'm making is to consider this. During the age and the beginning of the age of enlightenment, it became necessary to have philosophical intellectual justification for institutions and such. And so the construct of race got created in order to attempt to justify the enslavement of an entire group of people over something as trivial as pigment. Yes, it's stupid. Yes, it's outrageous. But that was actually part of it. The point I'm making is that racism, imperialism, and corporatism are actually historically inextricably intertwined. And I'm not the first American to say that because what combines them is, at its nutshell, oppression and exploitation. And a great American said basically the same thing in what I believe was his best political speech. It's not this fellow's most famous speech, because his most famous speech is, I have a dream. Who am I talking about? Martin Luther King Jr., absolutely. And the, the I have a dream speech is his most famous speech, and it's an eloquent speech, it's a beautiful speech. But for my money, it's not his best political speech. Because for my money, King's best political speech was not delivered in Washington, D.C. King's best political speech was delivered in New York City, specifically in Harlem, very specifically at the Riverside Church. I see some of you know this speech. It's also known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam. And in that speech, King said, the United States of America is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. King was a man of faith. This is very powerful language. The United States is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. And this decay is the result of the triple evils. Again, this is strong language from a man of faith. The triple evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism or greed. And King said that unless and until Americans are willing to come to terms with those, we cannot become the country that we want to be. King said we can't become the country that we deserve to be. King said we can't become the country that God wants us to be unless and until we deal with those exploitive oppressions. And you know what, folks? King was right. He was right then and he's right now. And I think that what we have to do is come to understand that we've really got to deal at the root level with the kind of exploitation and oppression that is endemic in so much of our economy. And since I've finally gotten around to talking about America in my little story, let me ask this question. How many colonies in the founding of America? Thirteen. Thirteen. Come on, y'all, everybody knows that, right? Say it like you mean it. How many colonies? Thirteen, because here's the real question. Of those thirteen colonies, how many of them were corporations? Nicely done. It was a tr <laughs> Did you? Well, it's funny because it was a trick question. 
And that's because I will tell you, remember that the word corporation means to have or create body. And I will tell you that the king created each one of them. And the king created each one of those through the use of a particular legal instrument. Do you know what that legal instrument is called? Very good, a charter, a corporate charter. And to illustrate how the king would do this, let's do another quick little exercise together. In this particular exercise, I'll be the king. Why do y'all think I might be the king? Because I'm still telling the story. See how important that is? I'm telling y'all, we should ask ourselves more often, who are telling these cultural stories? What is their motivation? It might matter to us. Sociologists have learned to ask that question, and it yields some very interesting results, doesn't it, Mike? When you ask, who are actually responsible uh, for these institutions and why? These are important questions. So, in this example, I'll be the king, and now, Paul, it'll be good to sit where you sit. I'm going to make you a governor. Watch this. I, the king, with all political power coming from God, will now create Massachusetts. And I'm using Massachusetts because I'm going to actually quote from the actual original charter, creating Massachusetts. Because I am creating Massachusetts, but I'm not going to bother with the day-to-day -day affairs of administering Massachusetts. I've got other people to rape, pillage, and plunder. So I will assign a royal governor. And now here is the direct quote from the original charter, creating Massachusetts that I, the king, assign a royal governor and task the royal governor with the responsibility to plant, to rule, and to govern this new area known as, uh, to plant, rule, and govern this area to benefit me, the king, and to benefit the shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. Massachusetts began as a for-profit corporation just like the East India Company did. So did the Providence and Rhode Island Plantation. Virginia was the Virginia Company. Almost every one of them were originally for-profit corporations to benefit shareholders. Hell, Georgia was a penal corporation. Quick parenthetical. Do you know what skin color or pigment most of the original slaves had who worked that plantation? They were white. I'm telling you, if we start to really understand race and understand race in terms of economics and a ruling elite, it's a very interesting thing. The point is that the king created each one of these and then assigned a royal governor. But in contemporary times, we wouldn't think of Paul as a royal governor. What would we think of as Paul in today's terminology? A CEO, a chief executive officer. The point I'm making, folks, is the one way to tell the American story is not just as a rejection of monarchy as a form of rule. Yes, it was that. You know what else it was? A people's uprising against corporate rule. The Boston Tea Party, somebody should tell the Tea Party supporters, <laughs> was actually a people's uprising against corporations. Oh, and by the way, did the... The, during the, the Boston Tea Party, did they throw all the tea into the harbor? No. no. There was only one corporation's tea who went in. India. The East India Company. I wonder if that matters. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's kind of astounding to me, but again, stories matter, and that's a very effective story. But if we learn to tell that story just with, this is actually all factually true, but if we learn how to tell that story with just a little bit of spin, it becomes a much different story, doesn't it? I think this is part of what I'm getting at. We need to learn to tell these stories. And, by the way, another way to say this is, the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. So maybe today we can do more than just ask for more socially responsible corporations. Or as Phil said, at the very least, let's never say, let's ask corporations to be good citizens. Corporations are not citizens by definition. And I think it's important to say, those people who would become revolutionaries, only 10 years before the revolution actually erupted, those same people were writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, Father King... We, your humble children, come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is administering unfair laws. 
it wasn't taxation without representation. That was actually a minor complaint. The real complaint, unfair business and trade laws that the English Parliament have written that are unfairly advantaging the East India monopoly over us. Quick parenthetical question. What percentage of those members of the English Parliament writing those laws do you think own shares in the East India Company? 100%. I wonder if that matters. Oh, Father King, would you please intervene on our behalf and protect us, your obedient and humble children? It was literally that sniveling, that groveling. And I don't know about you, but I'm very interested in asking myself, what happened in that 10-year period? What stories were they telling themselves that in one decade completely changed their mind frame and they stopped begging and pleading and groveling and boot kissing and instead got up off their knees and stood up and stood up straight, stood up tall, put their shoulders back, their chin up and looked directly at the king, you know, the king who claimed cultural authority from God and behind the king saw the most powerful military the world had ever assembled and said, you're done, get out, we're doing it different now. Because let me tell you something, folks, that process that I've just described to you, that process is magic. And I'm very clear about this. That is a magical thing. That is a beautiful thing. That's our legacy as Americans. And may I say, if one person stands up against injustice, oppression, unfairness, that is a courageous thing. It deserves our appreciation, our, our applause, but it's not magic. Because the magic can only happen if one person stands up and somebody to her left stands up and somebody to her right stands up and you have an actual collective standing up. That's where the magic happens. And at this point, may I just say, may the goddess bless the Occupy movement. Occupy is magic, folks because it is actually challenging us to collectively stand up together. Because Occupy is not just challenging us to occupy public space, it's deeper. The Occupy movement invites us, challenges us, dares us to occupy our own imagination space, to be willing to imagine what might it look like to live in a completely different society, one that actually gets our needs met and actually reflects the best principles and values of this country. I just think that's an amazing kind of way to look at it. And because we know that the king actually gets thrown out and a new charter gets written for this country. This charter is actually the legal instrument to describe how the country operates. What's that charter called? The U.S. Constitution. How many people here have read the U.S. Constitution? Be honest. All those hands go up. So y'all grade my papers, okay? See if I get this more or less right. I will tell you when you look at the U.S. Constitution... There will be two actors. See, don't just read the words on the page. Do like my mama taught me to do. Step back from the tapestry. Look at the whole pattern. Look at everything. And what you'll see is two principal actors. The first actor in the U.S. Constitution is clearly the most important one. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. Amen. Folks, all I ever have to do is put my hand to my ears and folks say, in unison, as you have done, we the people. That's because we the people are hallowed words. We the people come together to create the second actor, which is government itself. I want to stop for a moment and really underscore, that means we the people create government. The government is dependent upon us. Government is a construct too. Government doesn't pre-exist us. Government is utterly and completely dependent upon we the people. That is a very powerful idea. We the people in this document are described as being free and sovereign. What does the word sovereign mean again? The authority to rule. We the people are claiming the authority to rule. The king's not sovereign anymore. We kicked his butt out. And honestly, government isn't sovereign either. In fact, to the contrary, government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? <laughs> No, this is how it's supposed to operate. <laughs> Y'all are getting ahead. Government is supposed to be subordinate to we the people. Government is supposed to be accountable to we the people. You see, 
We the people are described and understood as having rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. I want to stop for a moment as a lawyer and tell you that the difference between rights and duties in this, pro in this concept is profound. You see, if I have the right to do something, it means I can do it. I don't need the city of Austin's permission. I don't need the Texas state legislature's permission. I don't need the federal government's permission. If I, man, I'm from Texas. I don't need my mama's permission. Well, if you know my mama, I do, but I don't legally need her permission. <laughs> Point I'm making is if you've got the right to do something, you can just do it. You don't need political permission to do it. Duties are actually the opposite. Duties are responsibilities. They mean you have to do something even if you don't want to do it. And check this out. The people have rights over government. Government never has rights over the people. Government only has duties, also known as responsibilities. Where do governmental duties come from? Well, remember, all political power resides with the people. In fact, that's another one of those magical phrases. In fact, it's so magical, I'm going to do another quick little exercise together. You don't have to do this, but I'll invite you to do it. it see if you're willing to do it. I'm going to say four words and ask you to say them back. I'm going to say, power to the people. I'm going to say it again. Power to the people. Power to the people. Let's do it together one time. Power, Power to, to the people. people. Now look at each other. I'm not, I just look. Almost everybody here is smiling right now. <laughs> right? I think that a big part of that magical moment, see, it's not just the words. It's certainly not just the words written down. Hell, it's not even saying the words out loud. The magic to invoke it, really, you have to say it out loud together with other people, and we have to believe it. You see, if we believe that we have power, it courses through us. It crackles with a kind of a mag like, like really magical power. And it is a wonderful and, and just miraculous thing. And yes, the people of Austin have all the political power. Quick pop quiz. What is the population more or less of Austin, Texas? A Say it again? A million. a million. So more or less, let's say a million folks. I will celebrate that there are a Really, a million? <laughs> more or less. Gosh. Okay, let's just, let's just say the city of is 700,000. So 700,000 Austinites hold all the political power. That is a beautiful thing. I will celebrate and applaud that, but I'll tell you this. I don't want to go to the meeting of 700,000 people where we decide where to put stop signs. And I like political meetings. I'm not going to that one. Anybody up to facilitating a meeting of 700,000 people where we make decisions? I didn't think so. You're too smart, right? point is this, folks. Yes, the people have all the political power in any jurisdiction, but we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government. How much power do we delegate to government? Only enough to perform the duties that we the people have already told them to do. That's what it means whenever you hear libertarians talk about a limited government. The government's power is limited to the duties that we have already told them to do. And where do government duties how are they discharged? By writing laws at the local, state, or federal level. And the point is this. Those laws express the public will. But get this. The one thing that no public law can ever do is violate the private rights of any citizen. Hold on. Mrs. Armstrong may have been right. Let's back up for a moment and look at the whole thing. So in our constitutional framework, we the people are free and sovereign. We hold all the political power. But we delegate a certain amount of our power to the construct of government that we create. Government that will be subordinate and accountable to the people. Government has certain duties, responsibilities, that they will discharge by writing laws in the public interest. But the one thing that no public law can ever do is to violate the private rights of any of the persons who live within this jurisdiction. Isn't that brilliant, actually? Our civil liberties are protected, but we also have a communitarian way where we make public decisions. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that brilliant? We should try that in this country. <laughs> this would work. And I'm not joking. This is beautiful. And I'm also not joking. This would work. And I'm also not joking that we've never actually experienced it. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how beautiful and brilliant the U.S. Constitution is, time out. Somebody tell me what year the Constitution gets ratified and becomes the supreme law of the land. 
Nicely done, 1789, good job. The reason I wanted that date certain, 1789, whenever this becomes the actual supreme law of the land, is so I can now ask, now that we know what a legal person is, the ability to assert rights, who's a legal person in 1789? What are their characteristics? So you have to be white, and you have to be a man. Oh, a property owner. That's a lot of qualifications. You have to be white. If you're not white, you're not legally a person. If you're not a man, you're not legally a person. If you're not wealthy with enough property, you're not legally a person. Another way to say this, folks, is that for all the beautiful framework that we've been taught in its application, this is a founding violence against the indigenous people who were already here and were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. That's the truth. It's a founding violence against the Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun or the point of a spear and forced to build this country with ch slave labor. That's a fact. It's the truth. It's a founding violence against women. This is not just that women couldn't vote. I mean, that's actually a minor detail. Women couldn't even enter into contracts. You know why? Because they didn't have capacity. They were like children. Women couldn't own property. As you correctly point out, women were property by any reasonable understanding of that word. And most white men were not actually legally persons because most of the white men were either indentured servants themselves or at best second class citizens. You know what percentage of the adult human beings living in 1789 could actually claim legal personhood? You know what percentage? 10%? 20%? I, 1%. <laughs> you know what? That 1% meme is super awesome. It really is. I mean, kudos, like, you want to talk about people who know stories? The Occupy group really are very good at it. But actually, what's really, really scary is the really ruling elite. Now, I don't mean just the rich. I don't mean just the really rich. I mean the crazy, stupid, outrageously rich. They're actually about 0.0038 percent of the population. But I'll tell you, the chant, we are the 99 percent, that's just a lot catchier than we are the 99.873829 percent. So please keep using the 99 percent meme and the 1 percent, that's really good. But honestly folks, at this time only 5 percent were legally persons. Another way to say that is 95% of the humans weren't legally persons. And I tell all those truths not so we can, like, uh, you know, be negative about it, but because I believe what Nelson Mandela said in South Africa when he said, if you live in an unjust situation and you want to peacefully create a just situation, you need a truth and reconciliation process. You have to find a way to tell the truth, both about anybody who suffered oppression and anybody who benefited from it, just so you tell the truth, but not so that you can wallow in guilt or shame, but so you can reconcile it and move past it. So as a white person, I think that we white people have got to actually come to terms with how white skin privilege actually operates and what that means, how we've got to actually, as men, have got to acknowledge how a male privilege has actually operated in society. And again, not to bash on men or not to bash on white people, but just so that we can honestly assess that. But here's the thing, y'all. Now, some people might look at this and say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment about imperialism of 500 years ago, but hey, man, today we got rid of slavery. Women can vote. It's all good. To which I say, au contraire, mon frere, it ain't all good. It ain't all good at all, and a big part of the reason it ain't all good right now is the operation of the most dominant institution on planet Earth today. That is? <laughs> Nicely done. I would say it's the corporation. And so, is this helpful, this framework for our legal system? I hope it is, because I would say it might ask us and behoove us to say, well, where would a corporation go? Well, remember this. Oh, here's something. Somebody tell me what it takes to form a corporation in Texas today. Three. Three people file some paperwork and file a rather trivial filing fee with the Secretary of State. And as, $25. And as long as your $25 check clears and your paperwork is in order, do you know what the Secretary of State will do? They'll send you a piece of paper. A piece of paper. That paper is called charter. a charter. Do you know how long your corporate charter can last in Texas? Forever. Forever. 
You know what you can do with the corporate charter under Texas law today? The Texas Corporation Code says all lawful activities, any legally permissible activity. Some of us say, well, apparently if you have enough money, you can do illegal things and get away with it. But the point I'm making is we don't even really think about the corporation today. We don't think about the first principles around this dominant institution. Now I tell you that so I can take us back to 1789 and share with you what it once took to form a corporate charter. First, you had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government and that bill had to pass by a majority and then that same bill had to go to the upper house or the state senate and it had to pass by a majority and then that bill had to go to the governor and the governor had to be willing to sign it. Does that sound like the corporation of today? Of course not. I'm describing what today we would call a law. Anybody besides me ever lobbied to get a law passed in the state of Texas? How hard is that? It's crazy hard, right? I mean, the mechanics are just super high. And now, get this, that's just the mechanics. In the process, the substance of your corporate charter application, you had to prove that there was a public need that was not being met by either existing business or by governmental action. And if you were given the privilege of incorporation, all you could ever do was that specific thing. If you ever did any kind of business beyond what you had been granted your charter for, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. The corporate charter was revoked just for going what's known as ultra vires, or in Latin, beyond the authority. By the way, do you know how long your corporate charter would last? Three years, five years, at the most ten years. At which point the corporate charter and the idea of limited liability just dissolved. The business could still continue, but the privilege of limited liability ended. And if you wanted to continue that business with limited liability, you had to apply all over again. Oh, and by the way, even if you were in the narrow time period for which your corporate charter had been granted, even if you were doing the specific type of business you said you were going to do, if you ever acted outside the public interest, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Corporate charters were once routinely revoked in this country. And not just in 1789, but for roughly the next 75 to 100 years. Folks, this isn't just David Cobb's wishful thinking. This isn't just the move to amend's position on what we ought to do, although it is. Hell, it's not just the Green Party's position on how to treat a corporation, although it is. This is actually our history. Now, I'm not saying that 1789 was the land of milk and honey. Slavery existed. The patriarchy was real. Workers were being systematically oppressed. But what I am saying is we have a history in this country of appropriately controlling the instrument of the corporation because it's a privilege, not a right, to incorporate. And so, since I made such a big deal about it, isn't it obvious that it takes an action of state government to create a corporate charter? That corporate charter can be used to hold the corporate entity subordinate and accountable. The corporate charter describes the duties of what a corporation can do. That I will assert that the corporation should only be allowed to exist if it's actually serving the public interest. Isn't it obvious, folks, that a corporation should be on this side? And here, thank you for your patience, because here's the punchline. When the U.S. Supreme Court, in an act of supreme judicial activism, take that right-wing court, says, oh no, we're going to just create the idea. Even though the word the corporation is never used in our Constitution, five people in the Supreme Court are going to tell us, we, 315 million of us, have to treat a corporation as if it's a person with constitutional rights. And that perverts this whole framework. See, corporate personhood is not just an illogical idea, which it is. Corporate personhood or corporations having constitutional rights is not just a stupid idea, which it is. Corporate constitutional rights is a linchpin for how the ruling elite have hijacked our ability to govern ourselves. And as a lawyer, what chaps my hide, what really makes me angry and is an assault to me is that they use our legal system to justify it. 
Because I was taught that the legal system was where you go for justice. And that justice is blind. She does not care what skin color you have. Justice does not care how much money you have or whether you're a man or a woman. We are taught and trained to believe that justice will be served. And what is wrong is the fact that the courts have created out of whole cloth a legal doctrine not just to steal our authority to govern ourselves, but to legalize the theft. Well, I say, ya basta. Enough already. It's time for us to raise up in a movement the way the American revolutionaries did, the way the women's suffrage movement did, the way the trade union movement did, the way the civil rights movement did. We need a movement today that is going to say, cut the crap. This is our country, and we have the authority, and the, we have the right to govern ourselves. And I think that movement is best expressed by a multiracial, multiethnic, multipartisan effort called Move to Amend. Amend what? Amend the U.S. Constitution to strip corporations of the illegitimate idea that they are persons. So that's point one. The idea a corporation does not have cor a corporation does not have constitutional rights. But it doesn't end there. I don't want to do all the work of stripping corporations from constitutional rights only be told, oh, however, but the Koch brothers, or for that matter, the so George Soros or other wealthy people can still spend unlimited amounts of money in our elections. So I also, and we at Move to Amend also say, point two, we need to abolish the idea that money equals speech. We have the authority to make meaningful campaign finance laws to protect the integrity of our elections. Saying it this way, isn't, this is also known as the well duh movement. <laughs> right? But it's kind of important because if we don't do this, I'll tell you, we can't do anything that we need to do. Because environmental protection laws get overturned. Public health and public safety laws get overturned. Campaign finance laws get overturned. We've got to actually build a movement that actually does this, and I'm very happy to tell you that here in Austin, y'all are on the verge of being able to be the first city to join over 100 other cities that have already endorsed the move to amend effort. Not a single Texas city has done this yet. We've done this resolution in over 100 communities already. This is a winner, y'all. This is something that cuts across political ideology. It cuts across uh, party affiliation. This is a winner, and we can do this in Texas as well. And as a political progressive, what also excites me is we can actually start to use this to expose the hypocrisy of the corporate right-wingers who are using a language that is illegitimate and inappropriate because, frankly, most registered Republicans disagree with this idea. And they are currently letting their leadership get away with it. So the question was, what, do, what is my reaction or response when people say, yeah, but corporations are just people, and therefore they, uh, the corporations have rights? What I say is, I quote the great liberal Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist. <laughs> For those of you who know, I will appreciate the humor there. Of course, the great Republican theorist, William Rehnquist, who said, corporations have great import in economics, but to ascribe to them the characteristics of being a human is to confuse metaphor with reality. In other words, yes, it's true that people come together in a corporation, but because people have come together, they haven't created one new being, one new entity. It's a, it, it is a confusion. My rights are my rights as an individual. And I, government cannot infringe upon my rights. But just because we have come together, or I may come together to form a corporation under state law, doesn't now give this new entity inherent and alienable constitutional rights. And depending on who I'm talking to, ma'am, I might even point out that to do so actually violates the, the philosophical and, uh, and ethical idea that only God can endow his creation with inherent and inalienable rights. Individually, my civil liberties exist because I'm a human being. They are inherent and inalienable. 
But I don't have an inherent and alienable right to limited liability. Limited liability actually is a legal privilege under law that only the, the operation of the state can allow. So the state can say, look, if you don't want limited liability, then you don't have to ask for it. But that means that your business doesn't have limited liability. But if you're going to get limited liability, we can impose restrictions on it. The polling data shows 80% of the American people don't believe corporations should have constitutional rights. That's clear. I think that the movement that Move to Amend represents goes far deeper than just campaign finance. I think it goes far deeper than, than just one sort of bit of legislation. I think what we're talking about, and I want to be very candid here, we are in the early stages of a movement that is at its core a democracy movement that asks the question, who is in charge in this country? Is it we the people or is it a small ruling elite? So Jim, I support any effort to engage in restricting the appellate jurisdiction of the courts, but my experience is that that kind of a technical approach does not actually inspire people the way a call to amend the Constitution to abolish corporate constitutional rights does. We're filing 501c4 paperwork under law so that we can actually make this a political question, so that we can start asking candidates, do you believe a corporation is a person with constitutional rights? And then we can start to put that word out to the hundreds of thousands of people that we're already in communication with so that people can just make up their own minds about it. Because, and we are not there yet, quite bluntly, but we will be very soon. And that's the reason that it's so important to collectively, politically organize ourselves. And frankly, just acknowledge that the corporate media is not going to cover this movement. They are part of the problem. And it's going to be up to us to create new media sources, new institutions. And again, I, it's not like I'm just looking over to, to Mike just because he's so generously uh, helped uh, the sociology club has given us this space. But as a sociologist, we have to create institutions that actually work outside of the current system because the current system is basically corrupted. So we're creating parallel institutions. So by 2014, I'm here to tell you, we are going to actually have a 501c4 that makes this the single political question that I think every Democrat, every Republican, Libertarian, Green, everybody has to answer. Do you believe, do you believe corporations have constitutional rights? Do you believe that money is speech? Yes or no? Vermont became the first state to call for a constitutional amendment to abolish all corporate constitutional rights and make it clear that money is not speech. Go Vermont, go! In addition, we've got uh, support from the state of Connecticut. We just got support from New Mexico, uh, Hawaii. The point is, we are getting resolutions passed at the state level. But again, I really want to underscore, unless and until we do the political work of making it clear that this can't just be a resolution that, as Diane says, oh, we passed that resolution, it's over. No, we've got to make that the first step of a multi-stage step to politicize this every step of the way. So at the, at the state level, that's where it has to go. And, and since we're in Texas, a so-called red state, let's just acknowledge this. Texas, like every other state, is not either red or blue, it's purple. About 40% of the people of Texas actually are progressives or liberals. So there's lots of things that we can do here. And here's the other thing. I'm going to tell you this. We need to get so adept at this conversation that we can call right-wing talk radio and engage this conversation. Not to pick fights, but remember that your audience is not the host of that program. Your audience are the hundreds of thousands of people who listen, most of whom probably agree with us on corporate constitutional rights. So we need to use the mechanism to begin to drive a wedge between the corporatist in the Republican Party and the rank and file principled conservative. I can't take credit for this particular Venn diagram, but it was very instructive to me. This is a Venn diagram where we ask ourselves about the two big movements that are happening in this country. The first big movement that I want to talk about is the Tea Party. That, what is the Tea Party angry about? I already talked to you about that. They're angry about government, right? And the second big group that I want to talk about is Occupy. 
And what is Occupy angry about? Why, it's in its name, Wall Street. They're angry about Wall Street. And like in any good Venn diagram, what we have is a sweet spot of intersection. And what is the sweet spot of intersection? The recognition, astute and profound, that Wall Street America has taken over our government, and so governmental policies are being written that only benefit Wall Street. Holy smokes! The Tea Party and Occupy have great overlap and similarity. And I think it's been a mistake on the part of progressives uh, to let, because the, the Tea Party began as a populist uprising. It was taken over by the Koch brothers because we weren't there. And the Koch brothers saw a vacuum and they took it over. That's our fault. We now have to go back and do the work of talking. Folks, principled conservatives have been lied to and sold out by the corporatists who run the Republican Party. Guess what? Principled liberals have been lied to and sold out by the corporatists who run the Democratic Party. We actually have a lot in common here. And I think that most, look, there are some Tea Party people who are just fun, uh, full on racist and, and, and uh, homophobic and xenophobic. I know that. I also know that there are people in element within Occupy who just want to burn it down, right? That's true. Let's just acknowledge that. The overwhelming majority, though, of Tea Party supporters and the overwhelming majority of Occupy people are good-hearted folks who just are pissed off about what's happening in this country. And I'll tell you, Robert, I think our challenge is to be willing to listen with respectful dialogue to one another, find where our agreement is, and find out where our disagreements are. And where we have disagreements, figure out if we can still work together on certain issues. And I'll come back to it. Polling data shows opposition to corporations having constitutional rights, oppositions to money in elections is something that unite Americans across ideologies, across political labels. This is a winner. Move to amend didn't even exist before 2010. Today we have over 200,000 people like you who are actively engaged. We have several hundred endorsing organizations. The Coffee Party is at the national leadership level, but we've got hundreds of others that we're partnering with. The Sierra Club, who wouldn't touch this just two years ago, is now on board with us. You know, Diane, I thank you for bringing it up. You know, the great Texas politician Sam Rayburn once said, as an elected official, when I feel the heat, I always see the light. <laughs> and frankly, I think a big part of our problem is we have not been generating much political heat. We really haven't. We've been very lackadaisical, and I think it's time for us to rediscover our political power and actually raise a little hell and uh, show people that, show our elected officials that we care about this. And do you know that in the Republican primary, eight people contributed over 80% of the money that was spent? Can you get your head around that? And they weren't corporations, That's correct. Individuals. So it's not just corporate personhood, it's money is speech. I'm going to quote Howard Zinn, the late great historian Howard Zinn. Just before he passed away, he, he signed on a support letter for Move to Amend. And what he said was, many liberals will go apoplectic about this decision, decrying that, oh no, quote, oh no, this is his words, quote, oh no, the ruling elite have stolen our elections, end quote. But Zinn continued, the sad reality is that the ruling elite have always controlled our elections, but they've done it behind the scenes. Citizens United just exposes it. So I actually think, again, it's a horrible thing, but it's an, another way a very good thing because it's, it's confront, we are confronted with how abject it is. You know, you, qu you quoted FDR earlier. I'll quote FDR now, who said, you cannot allow private economic power to become more powerful than the democratic state. That is, in essence, fascism. Just as Benito Mussolini said, fascism should be more appropriately called corporatism because it merges the economic might 
of our corporations with the national might of our military. And Mussolini thought it was a good thing. Remember, he was for fascism. So, frankly, folks, I think it's about time that we were willing to tell the truth and say in polite company the F word more often. We have a growing, creeping fascism in this country that is both economic as well as an assault on civil liberties that is taking place. And we're going to have to do something about it. You've got to start organizing in your local community. In my community, Humboldt County, California, we already have elected officials who are keenly aware that we have organized people and they are reacting to us because we've organized political power. We are actually doing this in our community, and frankly, this is Austin, y'all. Like, Austin is known as the progressive capital of Texas. You should be able to get this done, right? You really should. So thanks so much, folks. Thanks for coming out. Thank you to Rochelle. Thank you to Diana the Coffee Party, and thank all of you for coming. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Jeff, for coming out. Peace.